Mm-hmm. All Things Unexplained. Hosted by Dr. Mounts. Let's face it, we were always ready to roll without him anyway. <laughs> CJ Derringer. Ain't nobody perfect, right? And Smitty Neves. I've never planned out hardly anything my whole life. I just free ball. Featuring Cajun Man. I'm just old nobody, somebody looking for somebody. Previously on All Things Unexplained. And this is a great quote and article, and everybody should check out the article, Bizarre Cases of Bigfoot and Portals to Other Dimensions. This is from paranormal researcher William Hall. And William Hall said, It used to be that the UFO people didn't talk to the ghost people because they were a little weird, and nobody would talk to the Bigfoot people because they were crazy. I found out we cannot continue to do that. In reality... Quantum physics is leading us there. That portals could be why we don't see any bodies, why there are no bones. I have no official opinion on it. I leave nothing off the table because there are a lot of things we find in our field work that we cannot explain. Yeah, and that's that's why we're here, all things unexplained. Yes, absolutely. But it's so true. It's even myself, pre-doing this show, I would have not thought twice about anybody that mentions something about Bigfoot or UFOs or who knows what, but the more I've done the show and the more I've met people, it's unreal how many people have stories to tell and how many experiences there are out there. And yeah, we can't just brush this off as crazy as he says, or, you know, like why, why are all of these people seeing things? Why are people that I know seeing things? Something is happening. And it does seem to all be interconnected. It really does. And one thing we like to ask all our guests, Dane, and I'm interested to hear your take on this because, Ben, you also have such a grounded side in the outdoors and nature. But what's your take on the unexplained and the interconnectedness of it all? Uh, well, I mean, it's just a wide universe of possibilities. Um, you know, with uh, the UFOs and is there life outside of the planet Earth? <clears throat> I mean, uh, with the vastness of, of the universe, it's it's pretty, uh, you know, it, it's pretty extreme to say that there is nothing outside of just the planet Earth. Um, you know, we think we have a real good grasp of inside the planet Earth, uh, but there's new species uh, being found, you know, every, every week still on the planet. I don't know if you're familiar with... Uh, the guy, he's got a show on Animal Planet, Forrest Galante. And he's even, to this day, has found, it was recently, I know he did one in New Guinea and one deep in the Amazon, but he found these like deep canyons that had their own microclimate, you know. And within these microclimates, within these, you know, extreme jungled areas, mm-hmm. they were coming across lots of flora and fauna uh, that hadn't been discovered uh, lots of new insects as well as uh, you know some new mammals and reptiles a little bit of everything um, so it's you know unexplained until until we have scientific evidence of it and it's easy to be a skeptic um, you know that I, I always thought the sasquatch was maybe the easiest one to be a skeptic on because they're so large and in set not populated areas but semi-traveled areas that we would have just got one by now mm-hmm. we would have you know um but uh yeah i don't know man he's got to keep an open mind and uh get outside and live life explore and uh who knows what you come across i will definitely say um Captain Paul House to go back to him one last time. Yeah, the stories were pretty crazy, and sometimes you're like, okay, man, this dude's out there. Mm-hmm. But you know, with that too, I was like, but this guy is so knowledgeable with so much, uh, unbelievable mechanic. Uh, you know, his kids were grown and out of the house and successful, unbelievable fisherman, navigator of the oceans, and then he's got this heavy side um, of UFOs that you know. It, 
if you just ran into him at a, a bar and that's all you knew about him was him talking UFOs, you'd be like, oh, there's a crazy guy talking <laughs> about UFOs. But then you're like, well, you know, this is a, this is coming from somebody who's, you know, got an endless well of depth, experience, knowledge. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, just you guys getting, you know, finding these different characters and uh, different people with, you know, opposite you know opposing points of views and you know just get, getting the stories out there and networking mm -hmm. um, I, I you know about the best you can do just sleuthing the paranormal sleuthing the paranormal <laughs> <laughs> i love it that's we gotta, going on my new business coin card that one. <laughs> paranormal sleuth <laughs> I, that's fantastic it's absolutely going on my business card <laughs> yeah, I, okay. a, a little bit of a rant there. I, so I guess, uh, you know, it starts, so I don't have an answer necessarily, Tim, except to keep an open mind and, uh, you know, have fun checking it out. That was a great answer. Yeah, I thought it was. Do you, you don't know what your answer. former, that's amazing. Uh, you don't know what your former captain's view on other paranormal activity was, do you? Ghosts, Bigfoot, et cetera. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't really recall. I don't think, uh, yeah, the topic was always UFOs. Uh, and then it would be, you know, UFOs pulling fish from the ocean because he'd seen it and he knew that's what was happening. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, my late great-grandmother, um, she, she kind of just was into it all. Um, and what really kicked her off was she'd had some, uh, out of body experiences. Um, you know, I think one was from peyote in Mexico. And then after that, uh, I think it was, uh, her first heart attack, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> she, um, you know, uh, and, but, uh, you know, having these, um, out of body experiences, I guess just, you know, the opposite of grounding kind of ungrounded her. Um, and, uh, you know, just, so she was just fascinated by, you know, all things paranormal. Um, yeah. So I, with myself, I'm open to it all. Um, you know, the, the ghost story is interesting. Uh, one last thing about my dad's ranch is it, uh, and so it's called ranch. He's, he's actually, we got a little bed and breakfast on our place, in Northwest Montana. You can go to bear Creek guest ranch.com. Um, Count us in. Yeah, and, no uh, kidding. It's like I said, a, a large, uh, you know, heavy mountain area. Um, that uh, so my dad. So it's the only valley with, with for miles and miles, right where my dad's ranch is. It's a small valley, and it was discovered in 1890 by this guy Eugene McCarthy, who he was basically surveying the land to figure out the best way to build the Great Northern Railroad through there. Uh, through that mountain pass. And so they set up uh, a boom town right on where my dad's back pasture is for his horses. And there's still some buildings still there. And they used, uh, you know, for the laboring, it was only there for uh, two years until they completed that section of the railroad. And uh, yeah, so the primary labor were Chinese laborers. And as you can imagine, working, building a railroad through the mountains in those conditions, lots and lots of them died. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, there was a, uh, so our back pasture was like a Chinese labor graveyard at one point, but there was a large flood that washed away a lot of the grave markings and possibly some of the graves. Um, that was in the sixties, the big flood when a dam just to the West of us had broken. Um, so that was my backyard and, uh, and there's been, on and off when I was a kid growing up, there'd be somebody who knew the history that they'd stop by and uh, just wanting to check it out, just thinking there was some paranormal activity to it, knowing that, you know, that this was like an old ghost town type deal. So yeah. my backyard was a ghost town growing up. Um, I can't say I had a lot of ghost experiences, um, but also maybe I just wasn't, um, you know, you, you have to have the right mind or maybe you're just chosen at certain times maybe to uh to pick up on those things you know your radar's got to be polished yeah certainly you have to be open to 
experiencing it and i'm not just if any ghosts are listening i'm not open to that experience so <laughs> please go ahead and stay well, today. <laughs> you know it really is fascinating though how it's all come full circle on this show for us tonight it's not even the first time that we have discussed and quite unexpectedly by the way bigfoots and portals right. and no, teleportation time, yeah. our friends at the board camp crystal mm-hmm. mine have frequent Bigfoot activity and frequent portal activity. Crystals appearing and and materializing out of thin air all on the same property. Oh, by the way, with UFO activity. Right. And we've had guests, speaking of ghosts, you're like, well, how could ghosts, you know, how are they connected to Bigfoot and UFOs? But we have had a former guest who records electronic voice phenomenon and had a huge revelation. Now, I always pictured these. You've heard of electronic voice phenomenon, right, Dane? The notion you can use an old-school tape recorder, for example, and just record and play it back, and you, you hear voices, right? And a lot of people think these are ghosts. And we he revealed to us that these are not actually ghosts as in deceased humans, but these are extraterrestrials. Mm-hmm. And so, talk about coming full circle there. All right, Bigfoots or aliens, ghosts or aliens. Bigfoots use portals. I mean, it's it just blows your mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We need to have a friend's take. <laughs> and they love tuna. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the planet Earth is, uh, you know, very alien-like in and of itself. I mean... You know, if we had never discovered octopus and all of a sudden, uh, you know, a rocket fell right uh, on, on the land and there was an octopus in it. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it'd be, it'd be, you know. Uh, well, you know what? Actually, that fish this'll, that this'll, you sent me, Tim. This will really. Yeah, I know. Right. The fish with the uh, translucent head mm-hmm. they, the, in the depths. And get this. This was on the news recently. This shows you the news I watch. I'm mm-hmm. not watching a lot about Britney Spears. And, but I do know Betty White passed away. Rest in peace. Mm-hmm. But last week, I believe it was in the UK, they actually declared octopus. Is it octopi plural? Mm-hmm. They actually declared octopus sentient beings. Yeah. Really? Yes. Why? Well, yeah, they've got extra large brains and they can camouflage. And... <laughs> like, why did they just decide to do this? <laughs> well, I actually saw a documentary and this researcher, he took his octopus home with him and he is octopus researcher, right? And I let him start interacting with his family, kept him at his house. And it totally became part of the family and, and it, it did, it, exhibited everything pretty much that you think of and associate with a sentient being. I think that's a great declaration. They should have done that a long time ago, but I'm glad they did it. Sentient being. Yes. Occupy. <laughs> <laughs> no more fish Fridays. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, the videos are pretty fascinating. Have you seen them do the Rubik's cubes? Like they'll be, they can, you know, they're obviously their brain is triggered, but the Rubik's cube and they kind of are figuring it out. And then not only what? are they figuring out the Rubik's cube, but some of them, they'll yeah. also be changing colors. So if like their tentacles across the red part, that part will be red. Another will be across some blue cubes and that'll be blue. And um, I okay. don't know exactly what's I, going I on there, these but it's videos. a lot. I've been missing yeah. out on some really epic stuff. So th- this octopus, yeah, this octopus the researcher took home, he was always hanging out with their daughter, right? And it got used to the people that were in the rooms and stuff. And his daughter could just reach in there and he'd climb out on her hand and, you know, she'd pet him and and stuff. And um, yeah, it was just like a member of the family. So to go full circle now, as you just mentioned one thing about how Bigfoot's aliens and... uh you know, UFO are aliens. But now what if you were to put an octopus in the cockpit of a fighter jet, for example, you think it might just be a master pilot? Like maybe UFOs are octopus. Something tells me it could handle the G forces. Well, now we know what was in the UFO coming out (laughs) of the the ocean that your captain was seeing. Yeah. (laughs) Most likely. Yeah. And you've said, 
I don't know about y'all, but I'm kind of a Simpsons fan, or at least I was the first 27 years seasons. <laughs> Uh, twenty seasons twenty eight through seventy five kind of lost me, but do you remember the aliens on The Simpsons? No, they're they're very octopus like. Oh yeah, hmm. and they're always trying to invade Earth. Hmm. Well, I mean, and you know, The Simpsons predicts everything. They really do. Yeah. Well, with all the crazy biology that comes out of the oceans i mean you know maybe mm -hmm. there is some uh you know deep ufo laboratory where they're doing some genetic engineering and releasing them every now and then say all right all right humans check this guy out here's the you know you know the giant squid the uh <laughs> well and you've got atlantis you've got the money pit you know where's where's the money pit at up there and around off the shore of canada somewhere I don't know what you're talking about. It's uh, Oak Island. Oak, Oak Island. Yeah, yeah they had the Discovery Show about that. You know, they think it was like a, a ship, right? a ship maybe, and then the bounty from the ship was put in a well or a cave or so, something along those lines. But uh, yeah, I, I did. I caught a little bit of uh, wind of uh, the money pit. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, there's ancient tales of civilizations that were out in the ocean, mm -hmm. you know, or disappeared into the ocean. I mean, who knows? Well, now we've gone really deep with all of our theories. But it all deep into the ocean. Good one, CJ. Thanks. That's what you keep your eyes <laughs> for, really. <laughs> one of my very best friends, uh, Claude Tristram, we work together in the ocean quite a bit. He's a charter boat captain in Isla Mirada now. Uh, he lives in Key Largo, but basically, like straight off the coast of his house, about 25 miles, is a little underwater laboratory that we have. A lot of people don't know it exists. It's only like 60 feet of water. Um, and it's pretty dang fascinating that a lot of the astronauts, before they go to space, they'll spend a month down there, I guess, to get used to pressure and I don't know if it's lack of gravity or just living in a spaceship. But uh, he's actually fished near it. Um, but pretty fascinating. They've got like these pods, for example. a month like, underwater? Yeah, the astronauts will. Yeah, they'll spend wow. yeah, 30 days down there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's pretty cool. Uh, I've, I've listened to some podcasts on, you know, their experience down there and the things they see. Um, just uh, one of the craziest things is about their bathroom. You know, they, they don't they don't have anywhere for the waste and stuff to go. So they basically have a pod in the same way that you put a cup like in a bucket of water and it'll hold the oxygen. They've got mm -hmm. a big glass pod down there away from the main station. So if you have to go to the bathroom, you swim outside the pod or out, outside of the ship into, into this pod. And then you, you, you swim underneath and you're basically, you've got about two feet of air so you can breathe and you just go to the bathroom in, in the, in ocean, the ocean water. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it sounds so wow. freaky cause it's like a, it's a horror movie. Yeah. They're looking back. I mean, they're just there in the dark and they talk about just these weird creatures. They're trying to go to the bathroom or swimming by and yeah, oh, it absolutely you're does. You're talking about being, annoyed at having to go in the middle of the night no kidding yeah, seriously. i don't like having to go when i'm camping <laughs> like let alone underwater is that a is that a megalodon or uh, am i just sleepy <laughs> yeah that, that'd be something uh yeah we got a, a few things to youtube now uh you know black bear no kidding. octopus not and uh, the uh, and the and the keys um underwater space station yeah and it reminds me of some breaking news we had on the unexplained update recently where our astronauts aboard, I guess, the space station, right? Their facilities broke down, right, CJ? Um, I don't think it was on a space station. It was on a it was on one of the rockets coming back to space. Right. And their facilities broke down yes. and they had to bust out the astronaut diapers. diapers. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess what do you do? You know, that's <laughs> like uh a lot of movies like survival movies and different stuff you know that that part they never go into for obvious reasons they never factor but, uh, that in you're right they don't factor it in everybody poops yeah. i read the book yesterday yeah i was just I watching a weird one on hbo where these people are surviving <laughs> for months in a chicago penthouse and i'm like well you know there's no power or anything where are they going you know with this apocalypse going on where's, where's all the waste <laughs> going i don't really want to know but um yeah i mean humans are kind of dirty creatures like that in the, in, in that respect mm -hmm. definitely 
Speaking of that, Tim, question. Uh, what have they said about um, Sasquatch scat? I mean, have people come across like, you know, just large giant? Because um, you'd think they'd leave a hell of a turd. That's a great question. <laughs> you know, there is a lot of unexplained scat out there, and you do have people that turn up what they claim to be Sasquatch scat, and of course they encourage collecting it and it's not hard to to find field guides and of course outdoorsmen that can identify all the scat bear etc but you know one of the theories there is that it's possible that sasquatches are so genetically closely related to us that a dna test might have a hard time differentiating but there there are examples of scat collection that did come back unknown from DNA samples, right? So if you think about it, it's not like it will come back Bigfoot. I mean, there's no, no Bigfoots in the DNA database, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, but you'd think like, okay, well, they're testing, test negative for black bear, negative for human, you know, but if it's large and, you know, you've especially, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I guess they're mostly herbivores, but uh, obviously some encounters believe they're carnivores or if they're like us, it's they'll eat whatever. Well, we've had guests that said they're both, but some are mostly herbivores and it's actually the ones that eat meat that you want to avoid, that the meat eating Remember this, CJ, mm-hmm. the meat-eating Bigfoots are more aggressive and hostile. Well, that makes sense. I thought they called them, like, man-eaters. <laughs> oh, yeah. Man-eaters or meat-eaters, meat, meat eaters, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. I can't quite remember. But they're more aggressive. They're more hostile in that the, the Native Americans, and this was actually in Idaho, I believe, actually avoided them. Avoided those. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd imagine probably the same way you'd avoid a grizzly bear or a, a mountain lion. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Common sense. And a lot of scat does. Yeah, a lot of scat does come back as bear, but I think bear scat is so recognizable. I think it's, I, I don't think they send in a lot of bear scat, <laughs> to be honest, because they're like, yeah, that's a Who's that's going big around bear poo. sending in scat? And where are they sending it? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Where do you There's send laboratories? You. <laughs> well, you know, I tell you what, I mean, your local extension agencies, universities have labs that, that will run the, that sort of test. It reminds me of our, when we were investigating the Mr. Billy episode, the, mm-hmm. you know, witness of the famous UFO sighting in Flora, Mississippi. And I started contacting people at Mississippi State, you know, and they were more than willing to, to help and even kind of tell me some off-the-record spooky stuff. So, yeah, there's places in this scat, too. And I'm going to be the crazy scat you know, lady, just picking up scat in bags and sending it off like I would my garden soil to see what's in it. Yep. There's another bag from CJ. I wonder what this <laughs> one is. <laughs> what a treasure. Hit your, yeah. I was actually... Your neighbor's Rottweiler. Yeah, I was actually <laughs> reading online today about how the uh, Bigfoot population really took a hit during the Mount St. Helens explosion. Remember that? That was before my time, but I know my town in Montana, um, they said it looked like it was snowing. They had a, um, you know, really? half, half an inch of ash or something like that on, on the ground and on the windshields and everything. You know, and that's, uh, and that's, a, that's a ways away. It's an eight-hour drive. Whoa. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people believe there was a big Bigfoot population on Mount St. Helens prior to that eruption, and that the government actually swooped in, recovered bodies, and and covered it all up. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, and you'd wonder why the government would do that. Uh, I mean, I think you could make some connection, like government cover-ups with UFOs, because... You know, it's technology that we don't want other countries to see or something. But uh, Bigfoot, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Yes, and, and that is a question, right, that people have always had about that story in particular is why 
would the government cover up Bigfoots and their existence? But, then again, if Bigfoot is an interdimensional space-traveling being, maybe there was very good reason to cover Mm. up Bigfoot. Yeah. And that's exactly what the article that we talked about was mentioning. And, hey, Mount St. Helens, it's a prime suspect for a UFO base. Yeah. And on that note... (laughs) (laughs) I think that brings yeah, us my full head's gonna explode. Circle. No pun intended. I think we've done. Du- there's full at least UFO been circle. Six full circles. I'm certain of it. We now have created a crop circle in the universe. <laughs> yeah. Are you trying to bring up crop circles? <laughs> no, no. That's for a whole other show. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure having adventure outdoorsman. Man with me, Tails Dane Beck with us tonight. Dane, thanks so much for coming on the show with us. Oh, I appreciate it. It's been great. Uh, I'd love to do it again. Maybe do it uh, live at the studio. Um, and uh, yeah, yes. I'm he- hoping to get some a few more adventures in this, uh, you know, th- this winter. I was supposed to go fly fishing today in uh, Stone Mountain, kind of the base of the Appalachians in North Carolina. Could be prime territory as well. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was just a little, little wet and cold. So my partner, he's he's about sixty. Uh, not that we can't handle it, but he was like, ah, let's let's wait for the sun to come out a little more. Reminds me, I was actually on a hike with my son recently, and I noticed this amazing stick, more like a club, off the side of the trail, and I pick it up, and this thing is 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 hard and flexible. And on the end, you can see where a beaver had chewed on it, you know, and it's just the most amazing wood knocking stick that I have ever found. I saved it. It will be on our next adventure. I think Dane should be our first guest when we do go live on site somewhere. Yes. We are working on it. Absolutely. We have the technology. Oh, yeah. Well, you know you know that. I, I'd, <laughs> I'd love to. Uh, yeah, I had a good time. Uh, I think uh, you guys just keep it up here at ATU, and uh, yeah, give old George Norrie a run for his money. <laughs> Will do. Well, absolutely. Wonderful stories that you shared. That's really fun. I can't wait to share them with others. Actually, super fun to tell. CJ, you want to do your best Smitty and take us out tonight? <laughs> oh. <laughs> My best, Smitty, you mean absolutely unprepared and just wing it? Sure. Yes. (laughs) Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to All Things Unexplained. Until next time, stay strange, stay wild, and love all things unexplained. (laughs) Or something like that. And uh, (laughs) love the unexplained. (laughs) Good night. Absolutely. Dane, thanks. We appreciate you. Adios, man. It's been a pleasure. Oh, listener George Winter said, great show. Thanks, George. <laughs> Thanks, We appreciate George. it. You got a hoodie on the way, I promise. Who, George or me? You've been listening to All Things Unexplained. If you liked this podcast, please do give us a five-star rating and leave us a review. If you would like to hear more All Things Unexplained, Be sure to follow us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Our show depends on the support of listeners like you. To help keep us going, please be sure to visit patreon.com backslash all things unexplained. Our Patreon patrons get early access to podcasts as well as exclusive audio and video clips. Or you can find us on Venmo under the business accounts. Just look for at Bigfoot UFO. Additionally, you can support us at buymeacoffee.com backslash unexplained. If you can't get enough of us, go ahead and check us out at allthings-unexplained.com. A special thanks to our producer, director, sound mixer, editor, and the man who wears far too many hats. No, seriously, he wears a lot of hats, Dr. Tim Mounts. Without you, we couldn't keep the lights on. Thanks for listening to All Things Unexplained.